couldn't help but love black people. Mm -hmm. Couldn't help it. I didn't know a black people who didn't love black people. And number two, and this is not a brag or a boast. In fact, it, it, it sometimes, it, it may sometimes even be a liability, not an asset. But number two is, I am incapable of being afraid of anything or anybody. Because I love black people. And so Dr. Muhammad did for me as a student what many people, she will be surprised to know the industry that they don't even do. That she didn't just expose us to black literature. She didn't just expose us to the Hall of Renaissance. She also exposed us to the black art movement. And that's important because today, they even refuse to teach the black arts movement. They're afraid to teach. Yeah, Ali Muhammad stood up flat-footed. And said, after we talk about the Harlem Renaissance, which we should, we can also talk about the black arts movement. I needed to tell you, that's right, I needed to tell you that so you truly understand the tone of what I'm going to say today. And I'm going to say to my wife, 15 minutes, raise your hand, because she know I go longer than that, and she ain't got no problem saying, man, sit up, sit down. <laughs> She's been saying it for 20-some years, and I've been sitting up and sitting down for 20-some years. I did not come here to make you feel good today. My text today is dream, believe, do. Developing the faith to be free. Let me say that again. Dream, believe, do. Developing the faith to be free. I did not come to make you feel good today. I did not come to pat you on the back. See, I know I'm dealing with some media. See, the problem is you go to too many churches, and they still drinking meat. They have not come off the milk to get them some spiritual meat. But I know for a fact that Central been eating meat. Look at the work that Central does in the community. Look at the organization, look at the people come out of Central. So I know that I'm speaking to some meat. Ain't no Simulac drinkers in here. <laughs> See, I didn't come to pat you on your back because that would not be in the spirit of the life and legacy of Dr. King, who was a lifetime agitator. When most folks think of King, they think of some safe man who merely had a dream and wanted to get to some mountaintop somewhere and wasn't in no hurry to get there. But that, as you know, is not true. For if King wasn't in a hurry, why did he write his book, Why We Can't Wait, in 1964, which includes his essential call to action, letter from a Birmingham jail, which directly answered those who kept telling him, Martin, moving too fast, doing too much, won't you wait? And what I want to tell you is that you should never trust anyone who tells you that you're moving too fast or trying Praise to do too Lord. much. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because that person who tells you that is usually the person satisfied with how things are. Mm. And your movement, your vision, your agitation as it was, is disrupting that person's comfort. Mm. Because often it is the case that his comfort is based on supported by you being in hell. And that's the problem. Mm. Too many of us, myself included, are too comfortable in the hell that's been created for us. Yes. Jehovah made man a paradise, and man wasn't satisfied to return his paradise into hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it is this hell in which we will remain because we are comfortable. Mm -hmm. See, it's uncanny about human beings. We can make uncomfortable situations comfortable. Mm -hmm. What's the old saying from here, air to breeds? Contentment, the there we go. <laughs> Think about all the people who remain in unhealthy and unhappy relationships and marriages because of the length of the relationship. When they say, we stay together because we got history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. Bad history. <laughs> All of not one day of happiness, but they stay in that bad relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's no different when it comes to black folks in our relationship to America's white supremacist structure. We cling to America's white supremacist structure because we got mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And all of it is bad, bad history. Yeah. We hold yeah. tightly to our abuse of America, even though America constantly treats us like a side piece or a Jezebel or a late night call. Uh -huh. We continue to take all of America's abuse and wait patiently by the phone for her to call us Work like out. the other woman Work waiting out. by the phone, hoping that somebody else man <laughs> No, I ain't said that. I ain't said hoping that her man. Hoping that somebody else man. Yeah, we just like that. Uh -huh. 
And so the question becomes, why do we act this way? Why are black people so determined to live under the rule of somebody who clearly does not love us? Mm. And of course, the answer we always give is, well, that's just what Jehovah wants us. Mm. Have mercy. Again, I told you, too many milk drinkers, not enough meat drinkers. <laughs> if Jehovah wanted you to remain under the control of people who enslaved you, miseducated you, raped you, and murdered you, why would he liberate the Israelites from Egypt? Mm -hmm. But in our case, instead of Jehovah having to say to our oppressors, let my people go, he had to say, look, please let your oppressors go. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Mm. Now, some of y'all are sitting there thinking, I'm about to see you. You all right? <laughs> what you talking about? Well, Jehovah has to come tell us, you know, when my son ascended from the grave and liberated you from your sins, he also liberated you from your enslavers and your captors mm. and the people who mistreat you. Mm. But, Brother C, how are we going to love our oppressors and love our enemies if we? remove ourselves from them. And I got two answers for you. I got the short answer, which is the Sili answer. Then I got the long answer, which is the Jehovah answer. <laughs> so the Sili answer is sometimes you need to learn how to love people from across the room, All right. across the street, across the city, across the county, across the state, <laughs> them over there. Now let's go to Genesis 13, 3 and 18, when we find Abram and Lot in the midst of friction between their herders. Oh, I like this story. Here's what I want to say. Abraham and Lot, they were cousins, so they clearly loved. We're not talking about enemies. We're talking about two men that had a love for each other. We know they loved each other because he went and got his cousin after his cousin went somewhere he wasn't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So I want to establish that Abraham and Lot loved one another. Everybody with me? Yeah. But then they found they couldn't get along. They folks fighting, you know, they said, well, we can't get along. That's, that's what we're going to do. You move over there, I'm going And Abraham, because of his love for his cousin, gave him first pick. Mm -hmm. Everybody know you don't never get nobody first. <laughs> right? Because the person who get first pick, you to get the biggest piece of pizza. That's right. You to get the biggest piece of cake. And then you stood there with your mouth poked out. And what did Lot do? Lot looked to the east. That's right. All the fine land, the water, the vegetables. Well, you know, Abram, since you're going to let me go first, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take all. Yeah. And that's like black folk. Think about all the work we did in America mm -hmm. and the crumbs they gave us. Mm -hmm. What's the old slavery poem? We cook the meat, they give us the skin, and that's the way they take us in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, what did Abraham do after Lot took the best portion? Abraham didn't complain, he didn't pout, he didn't get angry because he had something that too many of us claim to have but don't really have. Watch out. Faith. Watch out. Abraham's trust in Jehovah released him from any anxiety of uncertainty and gave him the resolve and work ethic he needed to walk by faith and not by sight. See, too many of us don't have the faith of Abraham. That's why we're still stuck in bad marriages, stuck in bad jobs, and stuck as second-class citizens mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. Abraham wasn't worried about what Lot had because he knew that what Jehovah had for him was meant for him. And that he could only obtain what Jehovah had for him by separating himself from a negative situation and trusting Jehovah for his substance. So, yeah, see, we got the first part of the theme down pat. We can dream. Right? I know a lot of black folks who can dream. I, I got a friend. My wife said, you should talk about your friend. I said, okay, they talk about me. I got a friend been making a movie for 20 years. He's been dreaming about making a movie. 20 years. Ain't shot one scene. <laughs> ain't had no character. Come on, man. 20 years. You ain't shot no commercial or something. <laughs> so we can dream, but we fall short of executing the last two parts, which is believe and do. I know people don't believe because they don't do anything. If you believe more, you well, would do well, more. Well. Let me give y'all an example. Yeah. My wife has more faith than me, therefore she does more than me. I'm going to just be clear about it. My wife will go into her pocket and it's an hour refrigerator. No, I ain't say her refrigerator. Hour. She'll go into her pocket and it's an hour refrigerator and get somebody else's hour last. You know what it's like to come home and have your mouth all set for yeah. yesterday's fried chicken boy? <laughs> I mean, you've been thinking about it all the way home from work. Driving. Trying to get there. 
All but the refrigerator just empty. <laughs> she gave a homeless man a phone number. It's all right. It's all right. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. She gave a homeless man. Hey, hello. Uh, yeah, this brown. Brown who? <laughs> and, and, and brown like. Brown, brown like. Oh, you know who this is. Put money on the bar. Right? <laughs> like, look, I'm homeless, man. I ain't got to have all this. Shit, I'm homeless. I'm hungry. I'm cold. Come on, player. <laughs> Who does that? A woman in the image of Abraham who believes that Jehovah will care for her. She did these things because she believed. And again, most of us don't do because we don't believe. So let's go to James 2, 14 through 24 and read what Jesus told us about believing and doing. What does it profit, my brother, if someone says he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him if a brother or sister is naked and destitute or of daily food, and one says to them, decrease and depart in peace, brother, be warmed and filled, but you have not given them the things that they need for the body, what does it profit? Mm -hmm. Thus also faith by itself, it is not does the works, it's dead. Mm -hmm. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. Mm -hmm. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe. Mm -hmm. Oh foolish man, know that faith without works is dead. Yeah. Was not Abraham, look, we back to Abraham again. Was not Abraham justified by the works he offered of Isaac, his own son, son on the altar? So Abraham constantly proved his righteousness not by his thoughts, but by his actions. So, black folks, how do we have faith when our schools continue to crumble? Mm -hmm. How do we have faith when we've done very little to create our own jobs and our own tax base? How do we have faith when we are too afraid to engage folks who are addicted to drugs or who are addicted to the money that causes them to sell drugs? Uh -huh. How do we have faith when we take jobs that ask us to do things to harm our own community? Uh -huh. Paul already told us in 1 Corinthians 9 and 18 that we must not be bound to obey anyone just because he gives us a salary. Uh -huh. Yet we continue to make myopic and self-defeating decisions because we have no faith. And Paul was only affirming what Jesus had already told us in Matthew 6, 25 through 24. What did Jesus say? He said, my counsel is, don't worry about things, food, drink, and clothes, for you already have life and a body. Mm -hmm. And they are far more important than what you eat and what you eat. Look at the birds. They don't worry about what they're going to eat. They don't need to sow or reap or store up food for their heavenly father. And you are far more valuable to him than Get you up here worried about what you're going uh -huh. So based solely on what Jesus and Paul have told us, we can't possibly have faith if we continue to cling to people who hate us and maintain a system to oppress us. So let us remain in Matthew for a few more moments, particularly this is where I've been trying to get us to. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Because these verses reiterate what we learned earlier in Genesis from Abraham and Lot. Gives us three things to do. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. That's right. Just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. If they still refuse to listen, Tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan and a tax collector. Yet y'all still clinging to these folks. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> we treat you all, all kinds of things. Right? So the next time somebody tell you, well, Jesus want us under them. Mm -hmm. Jesus want us with them. You know you talking to a Similac drinker, not a meat eater. All right. Because right. a meat eater knows the word. Paul said what? Cover yourself with the full armor. Study to show yourself. Proof. You can't if you ain't got no faith. Now I want y'all to think about these words just for a moment because this is where, like I said, I've been trying to go. If you analyze the three acts that Jesus instructed the believers to do, you will see that they parallel what African people have already done to make resolution and peace with our oppressors. Think about it. What's the first thing you do? Go to them. We did. Hey, man, this slavery ain't right. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I don't think you had to say it two or three times. Look, I don't really like being a slave. I don't really think this slave is what I'm meant to be. <laughs> so that's the first thing you've been telling you to do, right? Then what's the second thing they said? Well, if he don't listen to you, take a friend. So let's go get a couple of more slaves. Hey, uh, they don't think it's God right for us to be slaves either. They said, if that doesn't work, take them before uh, uh, mass segregationists. Jim Crow supporters. The Bible you claim to read does not support the enslavement. That's right. And after you've done those three things, what are you supposed to do? Treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. Now, if we got any tax collectors in the room, don't be mad at me. I'm just telling you what the text said. So the final question for black folks is, once we know the word, what's next? Well, or as King titled his 1967 book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos of Community, in his final days, King was still agitating on the behalf of poor people, arguing for a program that created jobs for people. And even though he had been adamant in his opposition to the concept of black power, we find in his last days a man who was realizing that black people cannot wait for or depend on the kindness of others for their freedom. That's right. King's critical thinking was most evident in his last days, like W.B. Du Bois, who had been a champion for integration, who began thinking and rethinking his position as a general asserting, his King words, I may have integrated my people into a burning building. building. Mm -hmm. And like Du Bois, who eventually denounced his U.S. citizenship and moved to live his last days in Ghana. Now, I'm not saying you need to move and live in Ghana. Mm -hmm. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> But King became delusion in the ability of integration to provide sovereignty and first-class citizenship to African people. And whether or not King became completely disillusioned about the entire path of integration, it is true that as a critical thinker, he never stopped evaluating himself, his ideas, and his philosophy. The two best examples of King always challenging himself in the way I'm trying to challenge you are his ideas and notions on temporary segregation and on black power. King said of black power, after first denouncing black power, he came back and said about black power, he said that black power was a cry of disappointment, a call to black people to amass political and economic strength to achieve their legitimate goals and a psychological call to manhood. Mm -hmm. One must not overlook the positive value in calling the Negro to a new sense of manhood. When Jesus, when we accept Jesus, don't we become new creatures right. in yeah. Christ? So if we become new creatures in Christ, you can't continue to be a child. All right. You have to at some point become a man or a woman. For when I was a child, I did what? Child. 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 I acted as a child. But when I became grown. Well, and the first thing you do when you become grown is you get out your daddy's house. You get out your mama's house. Right, because it ain't but one grown person, no matter how old you are, it ain't but one grown person in your parents' house. Let's be clear. To the day my mother and father died, no matter how grown I got, I knew I wasn't the grown person on St. Charles Street. <laughs> One must not overlook this to a feeling of deep racial pride, to an audacious appreciation of heritage. The Negro had to be grasped by a new appreciation of his heritage. He could no longer be ashamed of being black. Mm -hmm. So it is King, the critical thinker, who understands that the greatest hurdle of Africans dislocated in America, that's right, I said dislocated. Yes, Somebody said, well, Brother Cena, how you gonna talk about you dislocated? This, this ain't your house. You was born here. Where Malcolm said, chicken born in a hen house, but that ain't their home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Greatest hurdle for Africans dislocated in America is not physical enslavement, but psychological yeah. enslavement. And psychological enslavement is not just a condition of African people, but of whites themselves who've been enslaved by the cancerous notion of their own supremacy. Yeah. So I leave you with this question on the day that we have decided to celebrate the life and legacy of King, a man who lived by the principles of the Bible. How many of you have the faith of Abraham to stop begging other folks to do for you what Jehovah has given you the ability 
to do it.